One of the more interesting challenges about gardening is that we can't see nutrients, either in the soil or in the plants. They're effectively invisible to us. We can only see traces or indications of chronic deficiencies or excesses, and I think this is a problem. There seems to be a common assumption or perhaps hope among many growers and gardeners, myself included, that with enough compost and perhaps the right fertilizer, things will be fine. And I'm not so sure about that anymore. Soil testing is a much more direct or scientific approach, which involves collecting a soil sample, sending it off to a lab somewhere for analysis and to determine the availability of key nutrients, and then to use that information to fix any deficiencies. I think this is an important thing to do, but I'm still uneasy about it all, as it's beyond my comfort zone and I can't readily verify the results or details. For now, I need to trust the experts, but as with many things in gardening, there seems to be a fair amount of potentially conflicting advice. I've chosen to follow the approach and instructions of Steve Solomon and Erica Reinheimer and their excellent book, The Intelligent Gardener, which is a great introduction to the topic and has detailed instructions on how to approach remineralizing your soil. But this is more than just fixing some of the key deficiencies. It's about balancing all of the minerals in the soil with the aim of improving the productivity of the gardens and improving the health of the plants and the health of the people who eat them. I've done some soil tests on a few of my gardens in the past and used them to amend the soil a bit, but I haven't been so consistent with it. But this year I realized that there are some serious issues with the soil in the new polytunnel that I put up in the black plot, and I decided to take a soil test and to fully remineralize the soil. This of course is in addition to using composts and green manures and other methods for improving the quality of the soil. I took a soil sample and sent it off to a lab recommended by Steve and Erica, but before I did, I added vinegar to a small amount of the soil, and it fizzed quite a bit, indicating that it was calcareous soil, which I had expected, and that changes things a bit. Apparently, this slightly acidic solvent that is used in a standard soil test can dissolve some of the calcium carbonate in the soil, which can lead to falsely high indications of how much nutrients would be available to the plants. So to compensate for this, I ordered an additional test that is based on a more alkaline solvent. The results of these soil tests are always a bit bewildering to me. It takes a while to work through all the information and even longer to figure out what to do with it all. One of the main pieces of information is the TEC, or the total exchange capacity. And for the standard test, this came back at over 17, but for the test with the more alkaline solvent, this came back at less than 11, which apparently is a more reliable value in this case. As expected, the pH is high at 7.7, .7, and the soil organic matter content is 9%, which is a reasonable place to start from. The rest of the test is divided into the main anions, the cations, and a selection of trace elements. The four main cations of calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium show very different values between the two tests. I'm going to ignore the desired values from both these tests and follow Steve and Erica's recommendation for balancing calcareous soil instead. Apparently I'm stuck with high levels of calcium in the soil without really radical intervention, and it would be better to work at balancing these four elements on that basis. Making sense of all of this requires working through the worksheets that Steve and Erica have created and doing some calculations to figure out the recommended target values. To help with all this, I like translating everything into a visual form where I can see that some elements are available in really high concentrations and others are at very, very low concentrations, but all are essential. It is a bit confusing dealing with all the different units. I prefer working in parts per million, but there's also pounds per acre or kilograms per hectare. But when it comes time to working out what amendments to actually add, I prefer translating the parts per million to the scale of the garden that I'm actually working with, which in this case is kilograms per 110 square meters, which is just more practical. I have calculated the desired target value for each of the elements based on the recommendations from Steve and Erica, and have included a rough estimation of the amount of nitrogen that might be in the soil, which wasn't on the original soil test, and a rough target level. The specifics of how I calculated the target value numbers is interesting, but it's beyond the scope of this video, and I'd only be repeating what Steve and Erica have written in their worksheets, which are available online. Basically, I have two sets of numbers for each element. One is from the soil test of what was found in the soil, and the other one is a calculation of what would be good to have in the soil. Both of these numbers are a bit opaque to me. One is from a lab and one is from expert recommendations. But my main job now is to figure out how to bridge the gap between the two. 
I find it easiest to visualize this as a percentage of what was found divided by the desired target. Anything that is at 100% or close enough is on target, and anything that is more than 100% is in excess. Anything below 100% is deficient. And the task is to try to fill these deficiencies up to 100% by adding amendments to the soil. Looking first at the four main negatively charged cations, calcium is a bit high and magnesium is even higher, but potassium and sodium are both low. Apparently the low sodium isn't much of an issue, but the deficiency of potassium is possibly the biggest issue with the fertility of this soil. Of the main anions, or positively charged elements, phosphorus concentrations are significantly lower than desired and sulfur is less than half of what it should be. It would be good to increase the amount of nitrogen if possible, but the specific amounts are unclear. With the trace elements, there is more than enough iron and manganese, but not so much to cause problems, and the copper is almost right on target. Boron, on the other hand, is less than half of what it should be, and zinc deficiency is almost as bad. So, the levels of potassium, phosphorus, sulfur, sodium, boron, and zinc should all be improved, and it would be good to add more nitrogen to the soil as well. This soil is quite out of balance, with some significant deficiencies. It's no wonder I'm having trouble growing things in this garden. Based on this information, I can start to sort through the various amendments that can be added and the specific quantities of each. Starting with a recommendation from Steve and Erica, I'm going to add five kilograms of seaweed or kelp meal spread over the entire growing space. This provides a lot of trace elements needed in tiny concentrations, as well as bringing up the level of sodium, though a bit higher than target, but apparently that's fine. It also adds a bit of much needed potassium and sulfur and would increase the magnesium a tiny bit and add small amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus and calcium. Looking next at nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium which are all deficient and also the main NPK components of most fertilizers so I can add a general fertilizer with suitable proportions. I've decided to use organic chicken manure pellets which is available from my usual supplier. Calculating how much I need to add in order to fill the deficit of phosphorus, it ends up being close to a full 25 kilogram bag for the entire 110 square meter space of the polytunnel, which is convenient. This amount of fertilizer also brings up the nitrogen within reasonable range of what is desired and brings up the potassium quite a bit, but there's still a way to go with this element. This fertilizer also contains calcium and it brings the levels higher than what is the desired target, but I'm not so concerned about this. The next step is to increase the levels of potassium even more, but Steve and Erica advise not to add too much of any one element at one time. In the case of potassium, they've set this limit at 100 pounds per acre or 50 parts per million. I've selected a dedicated high potassium fertilizer and will add enough to bring the levels up to the maximum recommended application. I won't be able to reach the target for potassium this season. This fertilizer also has a lot of sulfur in it and it will fill the deficiencies quite a bit. The zinc can be amended with zinc sulfite, but again there's a limit to how much I should add at one time, and this really is a small amount of material spread over the entire garden. It also contains some sulfur, but because of the small quantities it only fills the deficit a slight bit. The levels of boron can be amended using borax. A tiny amount is needed, but the recommended application limit is even smaller. This is an essential nutrient, but it's potentially harmful if too much is in the soil, so it's better to play it safe. And finally, adding a small amount of gypsum will increase the sulfur to the target level, and the increase in calcium is barely noticeable. I'm tempted to add even more gypsum, as the target in this case is a minimum, not a maximum, and gypsum is apparently really good at removing excess cations, such as the magnesium. So the full list of amendments that I'm going to add to the 110 square meter garden include 5 kilograms of seaweed or kelp meal, 25 kilograms of chicken manure pellets, one kilogram of high potassium fertilizer, 350 grams of zinc sulfate, 250 grams of borax, and at least 600 grams of gypsum. Most of these can be thoroughly mixed in with some compost and spread evenly over the garden and then dug in, but the borax and the zinc sulfate I will dissolve in water and water the entire garden for a more even distribution of these elements. Then once all the amendments are added, I can sow some green manures and then that will be followed with some overwintering crops. Next spring I can test the soil again, and in the meantime the complexities of physical, biological and chemical interactions will likely shift the proportions around a bit. No doubt I'll need to add some more potassium, zinc and boron, and I might need to top up some of the other elements as well. 
This is part of the process of shifting the soil towards a more ideal balance, which is part of creating a really healthy soil which can foster an abundant soil life that can lead to a really productive garden in which I can hopefully grow some of the best vegetables I can. There is just so much to learn about soils and mineral balancing and there are so many things that I want to explore in the future. It'll be really interesting to see how the plants in this garden will respond to the remineralization that I've just done. If you're interested in this kind of gardening or this kind of approach, please be sure to subscribe and if you want to help to ensure that I can continue with this Red Gardens project into the future, please check out my Patreon page linked here or in the description below. But most importantly, thank you for watching.